Today is December 7th, 2015. This is Hannah Crawford for the GPI History Project. I'm sitting with Dr. John Andrus in the broadcast studio at WHO headquarters in Geneva, Switzerland. Um, we've had one pre-interview and prep for today. Uh, John Andrus has dedicated most of his professional life to polio in various levels of capacity. He's currently on the faculties of University of Chicago, no, University Colorado. of Colorado, thank you, and George Washington University. Yeah. Um, thank you so much for making time to be here today, especially as you got off the plane this morning and mm -hmm. slept overnight on your way. Um, uh, to begin, do we have your consent? I wanted to get verbal consent from you to record this interview. Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, and to open, would you please state your name, where and when you were born, and share a bit about your early life? My name is John. Well, Andrus, and I, I write it out as John Kim Andrus because without going into the details, I was formerly Kim until um, I changed my name in the first grade to John. So I, that's uh, my name. I was born March 14, 1953. Um, I grew up in a small farming community, community called uh, King City, California, right in the heart of the Salinas Valley of Monterey County. I'm going to pause uh, it. So we've recorded the lead. I stopped the interview in order to um, adjust a microphone. So we'll begin with the opening question again. Do you state your name, where and when you were born, and a bit about your early life, please? My name is John Kim Andrus. Um, I was born in Boston, Massachusetts uh, in March 14, 1953. Of four children in my family, I was the only one born outside of California. My dad was in training in Boston. Uh, he was a country doctor where I grew up in King City, California, and the rest of my siblings were born. It's a small farming community in the heart of the Salinas Valley, um, a town of about 2,000 at the time. Uh, when I was a child, I have vivid memories of loading up the, sta uh, the station wagon after dinner uh, with the family and my dad uh, going out to various farms and ranches making house calls. He did that maybe once or twice a week. And that's how we all learned to drive, um, by sitting next to dad and being able to hold the steering wheel. And we also counted deer on those trips. But that's where I grew up. And I had a firsthand experience of what it was like to be a country doctor through my dad. And it turns out his dad before him was the second doctor, second or third doctor in King City. So there was a tradition there. Um, what was your dad like as a doctor? My dad was a, 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 well, some people call him the grandfather of family medicine in California because he ultimately uh, grew into a professional career of leadership in the development of the nurse practitioner movement in California and uh, primary care model of having a family doc manage a team of um, primary care members uh, providing health care, particularly in rural California. Uh, and he set up a residency network through the University of California Davis system. So he was um, very passionate about the quality of care, I remember. Um, and it was a time when medicine was evolving very rapidly with diagnostics and technology, but he felt that uh, there was a balance to providing primary care as a framework for, for overall medical care and wellness um, with subspecialties providing support services. Uh, so he was very committed to the primary care model. He was the first private doctor in California to get a grant from the Rural Health Project that would provide health services to migrant farm workers. Um, the braceros, as they were referred to at the time, came up from Mexico to work in the agricultural industry. They picked tomatoes, carrots, you name it. Um, they were, uh, in many ways, the backbone of the workforce in the Salinas Valley, which is often referred to as the salad bowl of, of the United States. So he saw a need to provide them health services. Um, and got the grant to set up outreach, uh, use nurse practitioners uh, to provide the bulk of the care in the outreach, and 
with uh, follow-up in a, in a clinic that was based in King City and backup hospitalization through the Me Memorial Hospital that existed at the time, uh, still exists in King City that, that my dad was able to found with uh, community support. So it was amazing exposure to uh, uh, health and I don't recall in my background ever not wanting to be a doctor. Um, except in the second grade when I was exposed to uh, forestry. And I got to know the forest ranger of the Las Padres National Forest. He taught me how to fly fish. And then I thought, oh, I want to be a forest ranger. But then that was short-lived. So I've always wanted to be a doctor. Uh, and I, you know, I w wonder how I went from being a family doctor to one focused on immunization or polio or eradication uh, in general. And I think, I uh, always felt, uh, as my dad did, that there was this basis uh, system that performed well that allowed for targeted interventions. And I, why polio is, uh, I think, related to remembering on several occasions his sharing an experience where he took care of a high school buddy of his uh, that came down with paralysis. And at the time, he and a colleague um, took turns staying up uh, caring for this friend um, with paralysis in a iron lung. And unfortunately, his friend died. And they had stayed up for some days. They were both exhausted. And uh, I remember him sharing that story and, and coming to tears on occasion uh, because this was a dear friend that he grew up with in this very small community through elementary school, high school. Uh, who subsequently became a, a local farmer. And uh, so I, I, I uh, was exposed to that and then the, the rollout of vaccine. I remember going to the school and getting polio drops uh, with my sister. Um, who so gave th them to you? Do you remember that part of it? Sorry? Do you remember who gave you the drops? I remember the nurse at the San Lorenzo Elementary School um, waiting in line outside, uh, classic sort of small elementary school in a rural town, um, uh, waiting in front of the what would have been a classroom, but it was, you know, I'm not positive, but it probably was on a weekend and because the classes were not going on at the time, as I recall. There were several adults, um, and there was a big sign out, come and get your polio vaccine. So I, I do remember that. Um, and so, um, make a long story short, that was my exposure to living and growing up in a rural, very rural environment with uh, this um, experience through my dad of serving uh, the community, uh, serving the underserved, the, the, the migrant farm workers, and, and, and what was eventually described as a model primary care approach to uh, serving uh, migrant farm workers. I think it still exists today. In fact, it does. Uh, so I was very proud of that. And when I, so I went on um, uh, with my medical career, did uh, family medicine residency at University of California, San Francisco. And um, at the time, I always felt that I was um, going to be like my dad in the rural community. and. Uh, deliver babies and uh, provide care as folks grew up and uh, progress through their life course. But um, in my National Health Sur Service Corps assignment to Susanville, California, which is up in Lassen County, very rural, very remote area, I um, served two years. And during my time there, I started reflecting what would it be like to work uh, in a global setting. And, and I had in medical school, I heard some lectures, and I felt that uh, with my wife, this was the best time to do it. Uh, we had no children at the time, and uh, so I applied to different jobs, uh, had a stack of rejection letters, including letters from uh, PAHO and WHO and UNICEF, and uh, many of them said, you need experience or you need an MPH. Well, I had no overseas experience. And then I uh, heard through a professor at the university from the John Burns School of Public Health at the University of Hawaii. I was at a lecture. Uh, he spoke about his 
uh, Dr. Richard Smith was his name, and he spoke about um, providing training to nurses in developing countries that would provide them with skills to do diagnostics and take care of patients above and beyond nursing skills. So very li much linked to my experience in training nurse practitioners as a resident. And uh, I went up to him afterwards and I said, uh, how, you know, this sounds very exciting, how can I get involved? I've been applying to work overseas, test the waters. He said, do what I did, join Peace Corps. And I, so we ended up doing that. My wife, uh, Alice at the time said, whatever we do, we're not gonna join Peace Corps. Well, we ended up joining Peace Corps and we went to Malawi, Africa, uh, Machinji district, where I was the only doctor uh, managing the healthcare of some 210,000 Malawian uh, very rural res uh, res uh, district right on the border with Zambia in a hospital that was built in 1908. So no running water, no electricity, uh, but responsible for care, particularly uh, obstetrical emergencies. Uh, so being on call 24 seven. At the time I was the only doctor who could do a cesarean section in the case of an obstetrical emergency. So I spent my, I, I, I then realized I needed to train the Malawians in high risk obstetrics and that's what I, uh, um, concentrated on in that first year and I trained three Malawians that freed my time up to um, address quality of care issues in the hospital. We had 12 bu bush clinics as well so I visited those clinics uh, and uh, then bridged to prevention more so in the second year because in 1986 that was the year of the African immunization and coverage levels were abysmally low, 20% coverage, for example. Um, and uh, UNICEF and WHO decided to focus on the opportunity to promote that year to try to improve immunization coverage throughout Africa. There was the universal uh, UIP, it was called, Universal Immunization Program, that had a target of achieving 80% coverage by 1990, and uh, they realized that they weren't going to make it in 80, you know, in the mid 80s. So, so they then targeted 86s this year, and what it led to was a, a bolus of resources to do capacity development. So to train your staff in the district on how to uh, provide immunization services, and there was a a lot of effort that went into that. Uh, meetings of the district medical officers like myself were brought into Lalongwe for workshops be, to be exposed to the training materials that WHO, at the time there was CDC had the triple CD program, Combating Childhood Communicable Disease, which was the predecessor for the IMCI program that you see today, which means the Integrated Management of Childhood Illness. So it's a package of interventions that are life-saving, uh, that include nutrition, you know, to prevent childhood nutrition and all the adverse consequences of, uh, that happens to a child who is, say, uh, malnourished or has vitamin A deficiency, um, diarrhea uh, control and prevention. So the ORT packets were rolled out, the oral rehydration packets to treat acute diarrhea in a child who may be having diarrhea, vomiting, becoming dehydrated. So at the community level, you could use this packet um, to uh, prevent severe hypotension or shock of a child that would lead to death. So that was a huge innovation. The immunization program, EPI as it was called, the expanded program on immunization was a part of that package, as was pneumonia. Uh, prevention and treatment. And so you put all that together, train folks and support them with the interventions that are possible. Um, uh, it was amazing. And that with this uh, focus in 1986 on immunization in particular, I fell in love with that. So to see the passion of the field workers, the hospital staff and clinic staff, uh, treating patients who would die, having the opportunity to prevent that with technology. So the coupling of, of that 
commitment and passion to the opportunity that a technology like a vaccine. So that then was a defining moment for me in terms of my early experiences. And I knew that that's what I wanted to do for the rest of my life. So I had a very fortunate um, opportunity after my tenure in Malawi to join the Centers for Disease Control and be trained in the EIS program, be exposed to the Oregon Health Department for two years. And there, uh, my mentor, David Fleming, talked me into trying to, uh, you know, to expose me and, and get me to think about working in polio eradication. So as my um, residency, which is a preventive medicine residency, provided another year to be focused on polio. I was working with the team at the Pan American Health Organization uh, at that time, and Ciro de Quadros, who was the leader of that team. And Do you mind if I interrupt you for sure. a moment, just with a couple yeah. of follow-up questions? Uh, mm -hmm. So I think you, you mentioned Susanville in California, mm -hmm. a rural area. Is that where you first became interested in global health? I had been exposed to some lectures in, in, um, in medical school. And growing up, particularly in the Salinas Valley, California, where half of your classmates are Hispanic, um, I had a keen sense of, uh, of, the, of the fun and joy of being able to cross cultures and speak Spanish. And, uh, and so I always felt fascinated uh, in ex through that experience. So, that, I think, helped feed my intent at some time to explore global health, test the waters, and see if it was for me. That was the whole purpose of Peace Corps. It wasn't that I was altruistic. I mean, I, I believe in the principles of Peace Corps. Uh, um, but it was an opportunity for me to really test the water and see if this is what um, I wanted to do. And it, and it turned out it was I, I, there was no turning back. Like I, it was a defining moment. So, Can the. I ask a question about Spanish. Mm -hmm. Did you learn? Do you speak Spanish fluently? Um, I, if you, if <laughs> I <laughs> notice, I stutter when I respond. <laughs> but I think I speak uh, well. I would not say that I speak fluently. There are certain things that I've learned to do over time, which is avoid the imperfect tense and uh, <laughs> and uh, and to if I don't know a word, I'll formulate phrases that convey the meaning, and I give it my best. And I think people appreciate the fact that I do that. I don't always uh, hit the mark on grammar and correct tense and so on. But reflexive uh, ten, uh, issues are also an issue with me. So, I, But I, uh, I, I've always had feedback that um, people appreciate that. Early on, you know, when you grow up in a small town like King City, where you know, half the population is Hispanic, you start from grammar school, first grade onward, having some sort of some form of Spanish class. Um, you learn the grammar, but you're never really immersed in a conversational experience. So you're responding to the teacher, Paco tiene cataro, no? And si, Paco tiene tiene, but you know, so you're exposed to all that until you get to a conversational uh, aspect, are you really challenged? And what I remember in my early days at Pajo would be speaking Spanish and you could see them start to frown. And then, and then I would know that, uh oh, okay, John, you got to recover here. There's, a, there's, a, there's some gap in information. So, um, but over time, uh, it's, it's just jumping into it, knowing that, yeah, so yes, I'll make mistakes, but I get the points across. And when you learn the technical, uh, jargon and convey that in Spanish, is, it helps a lot too. So that's a long-winded answer to your question. No, that's great. Uh, and I was, I was hoping actually that you would bring up Pajo in that, yeah. in that question, because um, I'm interested in all kinds of aspects mm -hmm. of what that was like. But could you tell the story of how you came to CDC? So um, I was in Machinji District Hospital and it was a Sunday, and uh, you know, on weekends you are able to stay home. Maybe on Saturday I would go and make rounds in the morning, 
uh, depending on uh, if uh, how, uh, the patients in the hospital, I might have to go see one or two patients. But then basically Sunday I had free most of the time. Uh, but if, if a woman came in labor or needed a cesarean section, that's another story. But we're home, uh, we were, I think we were reading, or uh, I can't remember exactly, but we're home. And, and I get this knock on the door, and there's a fellow by the name of David Heyman, who had been an EIS uh, graduate, who worked for CDC. He was, in fact, at the time, the CDC point person for the triple CD program that I mentioned, combating communicable disease, uh, childhood disease, uh, communicable disease and illnesses in child. The, 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 the CDC USAID project that was tremendous, uh, that it led to the, the uh, package of interventions. And so he knocked on the door. He had heard, uh, he was with his wife, Anne, and he had in his hand a bottle of French wine and a box of Belgian chocolate. So we're out in the middle of, you know, Machinji, uh, the small uh, town right on the border with Zambia, and uh, he became a dear friend for life after that. So, but uh, through him and getting to know him and becoming a friend, he said, John, you've got to, you know, uh, this EIS program is just what you need. It'll empower you with knowledge and skills uh, about the epidemiology on many of the things you're working with already in the field, but uh, empower you with a, a better analytic approach. And the, the principles, uh, you know, epidemiology is the language of public health. So it, it, the timing was great, and uh, he encouraged me, and I followed up and, uh, and applied, and, and fortunately got accepted. Uh, so that was, I mean, I couldn't spell epidemiology at the time. So, so having David visit, <laughs> while I was trying to bridge from a clinical hospital-based experience to public health that second year I was there. Uh, we actually had a public health district, we had a district public health officer, but no one ever saw him, no one ever engaged him. So I started having weekly meetings with him uh, because of what was happening with immunization and what we were doing to prevent um, and treat uh, diarrhea. Uh, so it was all. Go ahead, sorry. Well, I, we had a. There was another Peace Corps volunteer who actually I wrote a letter uh, for, for medical school. Annie Hislop was her name. She was in a couple of villages away, and she wanted a project that, uh, that could uh, help her get into medical school. She was an English teacher as a Peace Corps volunteer. And she knew she was going to apply to medical school. So I said, well, I, you know, I know we see a lot of diarrhea here, but I don't know the extent of the problem. I'd like to know more about that. And maybe you could review our records, uh, be, the, be the as they are. You could review them, and hopefully we could get a better handle. It, it, it just, what is the issue we're dealing with? And uh, I feel overwhelmed by it. You know, we see on a, on a given day, we might see a thousand outpatients uh, for a 66-bed hospital. I mean, they're, they're spending maybe not a thousand, but it was just a huge number of patients. And I would stand by the health assistant seeing these patients, and they spent seconds with each one. If they had a fever, okay, get your chloroquine, and they'd write the prescription. And, uh, the, and they had to uh, react that way because that's what they were confronted with. It's not to criticize, but that they were not supported adequately to provide the care, and they were challenged to see everybody uh, during the daylight hours. And so I started questioning how we might better um, provide services, knowing what the priorities were. And so Annie jumped on that and uh, did the analysis, and I think helped in many ways. So that um, that led me to you know to to say yes, I need more experience. I need, uh, I, I don't know what I'm doing. That's so I need, I need EIS to help me. <laughs> so. You figured out that you didn't know what you were doing and needed to gather more resources. Correct. So you so applied I, 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 Yes. So I felt that I was, um, I thought I was a very good clinical family physician. And, and now I had this defining moment that now, uh, even though I loved uh, clinical uh, practice, 
I'm thinking very seriously about bridging to this new field of public health and prevention. And so I just felt that we didn't have enough training in medical school. Uh, uh, and I just, I needed uh, a, a better skill set to make a difference. And so EIS was a wonderful opportunity to do that and then bridge to polio in particular and work with uh, Ciro de Quadros' team at PAHO. How did that come about? So I, uh, in, during my uh, preventive medicine residency, Steve Kachi was my mentor and provided me an opportunity to do an assessment of the immunization program that was being supported by USAID in Guatemala. And the assessment was to look at um, coverage, so I was going to be exposed to how to do a coverage survey. You know, the EIS is about learning on the job, and uh, same with the preventive medicine residency. And, so, and, uh, and in so doing, and with good mentorship, you actually produce a very good quality project that helps the program. And in this case, we were hoping would help the uh, EPI program in Guatemala. Uh, and I was there for several weeks, I think some six weeks, and um, to make a long story short, we never conducted the study. Make it long. It was, <laughs> it was uh, uh, quite frustrating, and uh, first to uh, get consensus on how to do the evaluation with the different players, stakeholders uh, in the field, uh, working with the ministry, who may or may not have agreed or supported the USAID funding of the project or the CDC technical support. So there were a lot of pieces of the puzzle to bring together and to develop a consensus that this was uh, needed. But there were some issues in the government and also issues in AID that led to the project being terminated, largely uh, issues around funding and where those funds went and so make a long story short, I didn't know that. Those, that was all happening behind closed doors. And I was just bound and determined to get this done. And having calls actually with Pajo, who I learned later was doing all they could to kill the project, because they, they didn't want CDC to be the technical lead. Uh, Pajo felt they should be the technical lead. And I'd had almost on a daily basis, uh, long distance call with the team in in uh, Washington, and uh, a lot of the time it was in Spanish, and uh, you know I was being exposed to uh, communicating extemporaneously, and um, I remember having these huge headaches at the end of every day after this experience. So after about six weeks, when I was in Atlanta back uh, uh, after the experience, uh, Cyril called me and said, "Would you like to come work with us?" <laughs> and it was, I felt like. You know, you just, I just got nailed in Guatemala, and now you're asking me. And I found out like, later he liked my perseverance. So <laughs> maybe some would say that's stubbornness, but uh, it was a blessing in disguise. I, I got uh, an assignment, a secondment. I was the first uh, to be seconded from CDC to a UN agency. So that now, which is commonplace, I was the sort of the test case. and. Um, uh, you know, I joined a team uh, that was very tight knit, and I was an outsider, so I had to to try to uh, convince them that I was value added. And it it was uh, that first year was very very difficult, and and Ciro was a, a slave driver. Uh, I've when he died, I I wrote a couple of obituaries that for journals, uh, obituary like. Uh, articles in remembrance of Ciro. And I was just very frank that he was a taskmaster. And so with that as your boss and the team uh, not wanting to relinquish certain responsibilities to this outsider, um, uh, it, was, it was very tough. Fortunately, I uh, earned um, the privilege of being a full team member after after uh, a very challenging first year, and once once I was a full team member, it was a 
uh, um, an amazing experience. He, he asked me to do surveillance, so to coordinate the AFP surveillance system. He asked me to coordinate the polio lab network and to link the two, to get the epidemiologists and the virologists to begin talking and working together. I remember receiving positive wild virus uh, faxes from the uh, laboratories and not being able to link them to cases to individual patients because the system had not been developed yet and so to be engaged in helping uh, overcome that uh, uh, huge obstacle was was a lot of fun and uh, the third thing he asked me to do was to um, put together the criteria for certification so uh, one of the amazing outcomes of all this was getting to know Fred Robbins, who was an uh, uh, amazing gentleman. You would have never known that he was a Nobel laureate, um, that he was a giant of public health. He was just an unassuming, very kind, very committed person. And to be exposed to that kind of leadership in to balance out the, <laughs> the challenge of working with Cyril, the taskmaster, get it done yesterday. Uh, it, was a, it was amazing, uh, so. I have a couple yeah, of follow-up yeah, questions. Yeah. Um, just because you brought up Fred Robbins, could you um, offer some examples of the differences in leadership? Yeah, the, the, I recall distinctly the uh, TAG, the technical advisory group meeting we called the TAG. Uh, for vaccine preventable diseases that largely focused on the progress of polio eradication at that time. They were usually three-day meetings and very intense. We stayed up all night writing the report to be able to pr prepare, uh, present the report to the members of the technical advisory group. It was in Rio de Janeiro. Um, about two days before the meeting, I had started a process of developing an outline for certification. So, li so linked to the TAG in Rio, there was a second meeting, which would have been the first meeting of the Regional Certification Commission uh, to certify polio eradication in the Americas, and that was chaired by Fred. So, so two days before going down, uh, getting all the documents, uh, studies, and, and slide uh, presentations ready for the TAG, the Technical Advisory Group, uh, uh, that was on all our shoulders. Uh, so it was a fire drill getting all that done in time. Cyril then comes to me with the request, John, I want you to put together a, a first draft of the certification um, uh, guide and present what it. What did you say? What, did, what well, was your response? You don't say no to Cyril. So basically, I stayed up all night, put something together. Um, I had visited Joel Bremen at CDC at the time he worked in the malaria branch. And Joel wrote the paper for smallpox uh, certification. I had met with him, and he provided uh, some guidance. I had worked with a modeler from, um, um, I'm blocking on the name of the medical school in Cleveland, Case Western. Uh, where Fred was actually on, on the faculty. Um, the modeler helped us better understand, after the last case, how long do you have to wait? You can pull a number out of your hat, well, small box, was it two years, three years? Why don't we do the same? But we needed more a heart, we needed uh, better evidence, and modeling um, helped provide some of the evidence uh, and a better understanding of how long perhaps we should wait before we actually certify. So we can't, that helped us define the three years. And I had, so I had, the, I had this sort of uh, uh, pieces of information that I was keeping track of that would lead to a more systematic uh, report and guide. Um, uh, but I had not intended to do that before this meeting. <laughs> so I put it together. And so you're back to your question, the differences in style. D.A. Henderson was the chair of the technical advisory group that uh, Ciro reported uh, to. Um, and uh, Ciro shared the six-pager that I uh, pulled together um, at the last minute. And when I arrived in Rio and, and we had a little meeting with D.A. as the tag chairman and Ciro's there, uh, Fred was not there. 
But DA just looked at me point blank and he said, John, this is mush. <laughs> and so I, I started stuttering and I, I knew I didn't want to get defensive. I wanted to listen very carefully why he would say that. And I did, and then when I had a chance, I explained um, the circumstances and where I was intending to take this. And uh, perhaps it wasn't as well written as I, I would have liked to, but I was complying with with the request and doing the best I could. And that's what you do in public health. You, you, you do your best to be a team player, you do your best to deliver and deliver on time, highest quality possible and at that time. So apparently, uh, it w I, I believe it was Cyril, it could have been uh, someone else in that small meeting, but uh, conveyed the conversation to Fred. And um, Fred went, he opened his meeting on the Certification Commission, went out of his way to thank me for all the hard work I had done and how grateful he was to uh, have me supporting the Commission in this work. So that's the difference in style. And that, for that, I would have died for him. And through the rest of the time I was at PAHO working with the Certification Commission, helping develop the guidelines and doing the other things as well. But that was just uh, provided me amazing motiva motivation. Because I work well with positive feedback. Although, you know, you have, everybody has experiences where you have to, to respond to negative feedback, but it, it's how you respond, how you, you know, how, how your character is gonna allow you to still be effective without getting angry, without being defensive. So a very different sense in style. And uh, so I always felt grateful to Fred for that. And Cyril recognized it in his own way. Uh, he, Cyril was managing the two of them. In fact, uh, in that same meeting, Fred is chairing and DA kind of took over. And Fred had to say, <laughs> had to say, DA, I'm the chair of this meeting. <laughs> so uh, DA was a huge, uh, leader and very strong. So you, so Fred stood his ground, and and uh, after that, it was a very smooth meeting with good outcomes and recommendations going forward. Did you, uh, do you think that observing these different management styles influenced your own later on? Definitely, definitely. I I love Cyril like a brother, uh, but I don't want to be the same uh, slave driver as Cyril. I'd rather. Uh, focus on uh, getting the job done, but doing so in a way that nurtures the professional growth of people and trying to understand them. What what is it that that drives them to perform and get them to perform better than they ever would have thought, and to do so very positively. If they can't work in that framework, my 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 usual is okay. Then. Let's agree you can't work in this framework. This, this perhaps is not your space. But if I could um, nurture that, and, not, and the other thing is not be uh, intimidated by having people on the team smarter than you. So I, 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 uh, I think it's crucial to have as many smart people <laughs> as possible and who are a couple of the intelligence uh, expertise with a mindset of just uh, commitment, total commitment. Do you, do you think about um, collaboration? GPI is a collaborative effort. Mm -hmm. That's the language around it. Um, so I bring the idea of collaboration and trying to bring that together with management into mm -hmm. a question that clearly isn't coming to me right now, but. Yeah. Well, you touched upon an issue that's always very challenging. You need collaboration uh, to a point where somebody is providing the final say. I've listened to everybody. I've taken into account all the points. Uh, here's what I think. And, and that person who has emerged as a leader will then, uh, you know, have another round of input, maybe compromise, but ultimately has nurtured that people have faith that we're on the right track, so we'll listen and perhaps we don't agree, but 
well, let's see, it's worth exploring as opposed to trying to prevent. So the leadership uh, needs to balance um, the skill of pulling together the consensus and taking the best course forward knowing that it's not going to be perfect and having the courage to do that, that you're taking risks. Um, so, I, you know, Cyril was never afraid to stand up on a table and say, no, I disagree, this is the way we're going, I know this is going to work, and people had to work with that. But that's unusual. Um, uh, but you need some of that courage to stand up and say, this is not right. Someone who, I mean, the nice thing about Cyril is that he always believed in equity. So regardless of where you're born, what religion, race, that person, particularly child, deserved the right of health care. And so if you have that as a frame, a basis, then it sort of guides everything you do going forward. And that's why I love Cyril. He never backed down on that. It's so if you compromise on that, he could, he could not live with himself. So he, uh, uh, so it was nice to be exposed to that, but then uh, uh, like, you know, like we've been talking about, it's balancing that uh, with getting team members to do more than they ever thought, ever imagined they could do and be happy and proud of it. So uh, that spirit of core. That, that, that was something we tried uh, intentionally to develop in India when we we did it in, in all the countries, but particularly in India, um, develop a sense of camaraderie and spirit of corps from the very beginning, the very first training of those 59 surveillance officers to come away feeling we're all in this together. It's like a team. You know, this is, the, you know, there's always the sports anal uh, analogy, but I personally, I had very good uh, uh, experiences in, in, as a youth in sports and had very good role models to motivate a team. And so the analogy is fitting in many ways, not to over uh, emphasize it, but the, those SMOs to this day are proud that they, they actually call themselves, I think the old timers or the original group, there's some, some name they use, and they're very proud that they're a part of that original group. And, that feeds into the other generations or iterations of training groups who want to be a part of that group. They look out for each other. Uh, ho hopefully 99.9% .9 of the time in the best of circumstances. And uh, they're not covering up for each other for mistakes. They're looking out to prevent the mistakes and get the job done. So it, it's, a, it's amazing added value, uh, uh, aside from what might be in the technical guide. That, uh, so to nurture uh, commitment and passion. And I think Cyril did that to some extent. He had a style to do that. And I learned from that style, I think. I have a whole list of follow-up questions. Mm -hmm. um, but because we're talking about India, I'll start with this one. Um, how did you go about thinking through the training in India for the 59 officers? Was the spirit, especially around the spirit, the core, because that's what you mentioned, mm -hmm. um, was that a, a clear intention? Yes. So we, uh, so you have the, you have the, uh, the technical components of developing surveillance. Um, but there are these other components like leadership, like efficiency in management, team building, communication, a spirit of core that we kept coming back to throughout, not only in like, you know, discussions focused on any one of those areas, but as a common thread throughout, I believe. And then, um, you know, so that uh, I think we emulated the model that occurred in Latin America with the field, the way you approach um, 
a suspect case, a probable case, confirmation, um, discarding cases, um, how you prioritize reporting sites, what is the information you need to flag a reporting site that needs a site visit, how you fold in active surveillance, but particularly prioritizing those sites that need more support, more supervision, um, uh, as a way to rapidly um, improve the quality. I think the experience showed that to some extent that worked. You know, the, 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 what we call quality surveillance indicators in India were achieved, I think, within about a year. It was very, from the training to achieving those indicators was in a very short period of time. So I think um, having uh, what at the time was, what we felt was a state-of-the-art approach to surveillance with the technical components to a managerial leadership component that was incorporated at all levels. So you had the regional level, you had the national level, and then state levels. And we found that um, that worked. And later on, particularly with the UP outbreak in uh, 2002, the decision uh, was made, well, the, the, the national approach is helping so much. Perhaps in Uttar Pradesh, where at the time was the sixth most populated country in the world, as an entity, the sixth most populated country in the world. And Bihar was the ninth most populated country in the world. So why don't we set up the national model and decentralize it, a similar model at the state level, so Lucknow and Patna, and thereby bring that leadership closer to the field and have those site visits defined by those criteria that would indicate uh, these are the sites that need closer supervision. Perhaps this person was only trained a few months ago, or maybe they're someone's sick or, or perhaps there's the, the uh, district leadership, government leadership uh, is not as supportive as we'd like, so we need to focus on bringing them in because the, that leadership, I think, was critical in the success of, of India, bringing in the government district level leadership and, uh, and ownership. So, um, the, the intent was, as recognized by the, the Danes, that they provided the grant. The Danish government, uh, the original grant was for $12.3 million. Um, like many of the Nordic countries, Denmark was very um, interested in, de in, in, in helping India develop capacity for public health, develop capacity for primary care, health in general. So they weren't really on board with polio eradication until there was an event in Surat, India, Surat, India, a cluster of deaths. And I believe Surat is in the state of Gujarat. It's a very poor community and uh, there were a cluster of deaths. No one could explain why these people were dying. But someone made the observation that there, are num that there were more rats dead in the street and around homes. Then someone made the connection that this could be plague. That hit the newspaper. And basically, the Indira Gandhi Airport, I believe, <laughs> almost closed. Uh, you know, embassy sent their, their, their staff home, uh, the Korean embassy, I think the Japanese em embassy. A number of embassies sent their staff home. And this hit global press, and so the an economic impact on India was tremendous. They lost millions and millions of dollars. To this day, we still do not know the diagnosis, what caused those deaths. So the Danes said, you know, it's clear this 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 if this was an infection that spread throughout the country, killing people, the the, the government or the system or the infrastructure was not a sufficient level that would allow them to respond. So that's why they felt may, perhaps this could be, we could use polio as a test case to help the government establish a system that is interrelated, that's managed well, provides the necessary support to do surveillance of infectious disease. In this case, it was uh, 
focused on polio. And that's how it all got started, because of the Sirac. And Bjarni Jensen, who was the health officer for Danita, recognizing the opportunity uh, that developed the MPSP. So, and we're seeing the fruits of that go well beyond polio to this day. The intent was to bridge to other vaccine preventable diseases and perhaps to other infectious diseases. And that indeed is what happened and is happening. So I think uh, the Danes should be credited Bjarni Jensen in particular for his commitment to um, allowing that project to go forward and supporting it. So it's uh, it, all with uh, run by Indian nationals. And many of those nationals in the, in the first group I referred to are now leaders in other aspects of public health, health in general, in, in the ministries of health at all levels. So we, that, was, that was also an intent, is to develop the human resource capacity to do good public health, do good surveillance, um, be the next generation of leaders. I think India at the time, if I recall correctly, only had two schools where you could get a, uh, you know, two schools of public health in a country of one billion people. They now have certainly large number that have been developed and uh, trying to fill the gap. But at that time, that was a, a, a huge gap. Uh, and I think we, we helped stimulate that. I'm going to do a quick time check. Okay. It is 5.36, so we have about 15 minutes, okay. roughly. Um, and I wanted to ask some follow-up questions. I thought maybe the end of PAHO would mm -hmm. be a mm -hmm. good stopping point mm -hmm. for this mm -hmm. session anyway. Um, so follow-up questions I have. Um, you gave an example of Ciro as a taskmaster, so we covered that. Mm -hmm. um, you would mentioned in the pre-interview, and it came up just briefly while you were talking, uh, that there the team at PAHO was not necessarily welcoming of you being there. And I was mm -hmm. wondering if you could talk more about that. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the, the comment that I made that the team, when I first arrived to PAHO, was not necessarily welcoming, um, I, I, I recall vividly. Um, the um, Cyril would bring us together for lunch on a daily basis, and he'd quiz everybody over lunch in between his comments about what movie he just last saw uh, and or book he just read. <laughs> so it was a mix of what was intended to be um, uh, a kind of fun bantering mixed with work. And so you were always on edge that you were going to be grilled. Um, but uh, when I came, uh, the team was doing polio. Now, it was in its early phases. And like I said, lab results were not connected to the epidemiologic uh, investigations. Um, I remember looking at a stack of faxes with positive wild virus. but. And I, I could figure out it was from a certain country. It could be Venezuela, for example. But it became di more difficult to locate the community. Who should I call? And it just was piling up. As resources started coming in, uh, the team was overwhelmed. And yet, they didn't balance that with, OK, we now have an extra pair of hands. It was more ownership over the functions and responsibilities a natural human reaction to having this young person who um, um, is from CDC, uh, who we compete with, actually. And there's always that elephant in the room uh, when either PAHO or the rest of WHO works with um, a technical entity that, in a, in a way, you compete. But you, know, you need to find a way to collaborate and be team members. And I think um, that was what I was challenged to do in the first uh, year. And I think I was successful in doing so. It required Cyril's intervention. And I remember some screaming in the hall, <laughs> you know, because it was very 
you know, Latin. You know, we, you, uh, in fact, the first two weeks I was there, my office was next to Cyril's, so the wall was paper thin. I could hear every conversation. Yeah, so, and I'm, I've, I'm, I've, I've been there for two weeks, and I hear this shouting next door, and it's Cyril saying, you will never talk like that again. You were talking to a minister of health. Who in the hell do you think you are? You cannot talk to a minister of health like that. He slams down the phone. He then goes out in the hallway and he starts sort of convening a hallway um, a meeting for anybody that would listen to him. Of course, people were coming out of their rooms because Cyril was in the hallway saying, who does Albert think he is? He can't talk to a minister like that. I'm not going to take him on any more field trips. That was Albert Saban. <laughs> that. So that's Cyril. So the, in that context, Cyril finally had to come down uh, in a way uh, to allow me to do my job. Uh, and I remember the yelling match in the, uh, in the hallway. But it, it then uh, provided me uh, the, op the leverage to do my job, and uh, which was uh, pretty amazing. It was pretty amazing. Cyril um, always ran meetings on time. So to have an eradication target by 2000, by 1990, by 1990, uh, when, we were, when we went over, he was upset. But, you know, it was only eight months over. It was, you know, August 23rd. 1991, eight months and 23 days, Arequipa, Peru. And of course, he was happy about that. But the fact that we were eight months over, it was, uh, uh, he just couldn't put up with that. Uh, and it needed that kind of forceful leadership. It really needed that. So I think um, I came away from that, that that's what Southeast Asia needed, that we needed to be mindful of that target. We made a promise. We were um, committed to the promise, and it was up to us to deliver. So it damn near killed me because there were other factors influencing it. I think we were successful in countries outside of India, like Nepal, Bangladesh, Myanmar, Thailand, Indonesia. They all stopped transmission before the target 2000, so they were successful. But India, the, the UPs and the Bihars were going to take more time. The issue was, for me, uh, one of the pillars of polio was being neglected, and that was the routine immunization. So to confront that, uh, Sobin Sakar was the uh, manager of the immunization program at the time. He, also, he agreed with that. So we wanted to decentralize the coordination of actors, stakeholders, to a state level that would provide support and be focused on routine immunization. In Bihar, it was called Bhima, which in Hindi means insurance. In um, Uttar Pradesh, it was called Upala, which had a similar sort of connotation that empowered that acronym with commitment and emotion and a sense of direction. And so, you know, I remember in Bihar, there was a milk distributor uh, an entity, one entity that got cold milk without bacteria to every village. What better way to have a cold chain? So we needed those folks. They joined. They were committed. The women's group, there was a statewide women's group that reached all the communities. We needed them. They were on board. It was for them and their families. So there was win-win for all of this. And we had several site visits, uh, several meetings and commitment. UNICEF at the state level was fully on board, but then it died out. It, it, it lost its power, it lost its oomph uh, going into 2000 or in 2000, and it, it didn't have the uh, central office commitment of UNICEF. And unfortunately, that I think in part explained many of the failures of the decade that followed. We didn't have a strong uh, foundation of uh, immunity in the population that a good, strong uh, central immunization program would have provided. We failed, but it wasn't for lack of effort. Before we go into India, is there anything else that you want to include about your work at PAHO? Um, 
The one thing that I mentioned that I, I w worked on the, um, the coordinating and being responsible for the quality of the AFP surveillance data and analysis of that data that was reported from the field site all the way up through the district, state, uh, to the regional office in, in Washington, D.C., and had the opportunity to analyze that data to look at VAP, vaccine-associated paralytic prop, uh, poliomyelitis, for example, and a number of other studies looking at risks and trying to define compatible cases. We use the data to change the case definition. We use the surveillance information for action. I felt to be a part of that was amazing because that's the CDC motto with surveillance, information for action. And there it was firsthand, hands-on, led to several publications that were, we were all uh, very proud of. The lab was getting to know people like Olin Q and Mark Palanche and all the laboratory, Jorge Bochel of Columbia, these amazing Barbara Hull of um, Trinidad, the, these amazing people, uh, very dedicated, worked long hours, that w knew they were fragmented and separated and weren't supported and, and just passionately wanted to be included in the whole thing. So it was, a, it was a quick fix to get the lab and the epidemiology to talk. It was a quick fix because everybody wanted to be there. All they needed was that little bit of seed effort to bring them together, create the space, and have the reporting begin. And the transfer of technology that that lab, you know, Olin and Mark's lab provided was amazing. To see what we, what they're now doing today is phenomenal. But it started, I remember we were talking about monoclonal antibody testing and, and then the, the PCR and the probes, all that was being transferred in, if I may overuse the word, real-time fashion to the national level. It was um, amazing. Um, and then Olin helped with the uh, investigation, the, the feasibility of doing environmental surveillance. So we were one of the first to do that in Cartagena, Colombia. We published, um, it was very uh, a nice experience, I think helped um, developed the program that's being used today as well. Um, we looked at continuous sampling of the environment versus periodic sampling. We compared the results with the AFP surveillance and um, it, we, we were able to say this was a potential tool that could be used to supplement uh, AFP surveillance and it's now very, very essential information in many parts of Africa the remaining reservoir countries. Um, so it's, uh, I think that I very, feel very grateful to both Mark and, and, uh, and Olin and the team, the way they, they work very long hours, very committed, make things happen. Uh, they did not only for PAHO, but for the rest of the world. And then while the, I'm being exposed and being a part of this, Cyril assigns each of us to be responsible for three countries. So my countries were Colombia, Venezuela, and Ecuador. So I had to make site visits. And I'd be gone uh, six months, or not six months, but six weeks at a time. Um, and you know, it was a, in, on top of your day job. And so they're going to so help coordinate the mopping up of the Atlantic coast of Colombia in an early 1991 because it was a race between Colombia and Peru, who was gonna have the last wild virus? Colombia had eight wild virus cases that year and Peru had one, but that one was the last one, August 23rd. Colombia stopped their transmission by, I think the last case was in April 91, largely due to the mopping up that they did of the Atlantic coast. They had three uh, intense areas of transmission, Cartagena, Santa Marta, and Barranquilla. And we uh, uh, did the house-to-house -house mopping up campaign that start, stopped transmission. Learning as we went along, because that was the fun thing about that program. We, we didn't have all the answers, like the environmental st surveillance study or the, the way we approached mopping up, how big did it need to be, where, when. Uh, those were all things we were learning, case definitions, number of stool specimens, all these things were being evaluated with the data we collected. It was a very, very exciting time. So, yeah.
Any final thoughts for today? We'll continue in a second. Second yeah, session. I, in the second, yeah, it would be nice to uh, talk a little bit um, about the uh, challenges going forward. You know, I have a few other things I might want to say about the India experience, but sort of bridging to the challenges going forward, uh, given the framework that we've been discussing. Great. We can even include a third session, I think, if yeah. we need to. So, excellent. Yeah, the a slower telling is a great telling. Yeah. Yeah. So thank I you. For today. So 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 uh, David Heyman, you know, when he made that first visit, so he was in the. I didn't explain this very well. I should have. Said, but he was in the capital, Lalongwe, as the CDC epidemiologist. They were doing malaria studies, a number of studies related to the triple CD program. He heard about this American doctor in Michinji that spoke Chichewa like John Wayne, very slowly. So, so <laughs> when he shows up at the door with, with Anne, who is a, a lovely person as, as well, um, uh, he mentioned that. And uh, it was two Chichewans had said this. Yeah, there's this American out in Chinji who speaks Chichewa like John Wayne, and that's me. And I tend to speak, to, to, in reference to your comment, I tend to speak slowly. <laughs> Great. Yeah, the, the, the slower, the more detailed, the better. That's yeah. great. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank today. you. Thank you. John Andrus.